and welcome to the online worship service for Mount Zion United Methodist Church and Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. We are online because of some self-imposed quarantining this week, and we're glad to welcome you. May the Lord, may the risen Lord bless you for worshiping today, and we welcome you in his holy name. Just one worship note as we begin today. Uh, our Ash Wednesday service is coming up this Wednesday, the 17th, and you will um, be able to participate in that service. This is where we normally impose the ashes, and we'll do that during worship service. I can't reach out and touch you through the online service, so you will have to have your ashes prepared, and you can do this by uh, taking some palm branches or fern. Uh, you may be able to get some at your local florist, or perhaps your grocery store might have some um, that you can burn. Do it outside so that you don't burn your house down. Uh, but whatever you do use uh, to create the ashes, make sure you burn them sufficiently enough to turn them into a, something of a, a just a fine powder. And take a few drops, not much, just a few drops of olive oil, vegetable oil will do, but olive oil is best. Cautionary note, do not use water. If you use water, that will cause a very irritating rash, and you don't want that. So a little bit of olive oil or vegetable oil, mix it up into a paste, and just have it available as we have the service, and you'll be able to self-impose following the directions as we join together. Both of our churches, Mount Zion in Bennett, North Carolina, and Pleasant Hill and Seagrove have a long prayer list. I'm going to read the names on this prayer list and encourage you, um, as you hear the full name, repeat the uh, first name. For instance, the first name for Mount Zion is uh, Roger Powers. So as I say Roger Powers, you say Roger. Uh, it's our way of joining together to pray together for our loved ones, and these who have great need. So let's pray together. We're praying for Roger Powers. We're praying for Jennifer Cagle, Nikki Owens, Sarah Hunter, Nettie Barnes, Connie Giovinco, Phil Holt, Jesse Frazier, Ted Bean, Cleo Brown, Carol Brady, Chris Barnes, James Emmons, Juanita Powers, James Lynn Boyd, those of our Mount Zion congregation that are homebound or nursing homes, Robert and Betty Kivett, Charles Gatman, Linda Brown, Margaret Brown, Larry Davis. And other requests, we ask you to pray for myself and Elizabeth. We both uh, got surgery coming up here and we uh, appreciate your prayers. We're also praying for Mike and Bobby Autry for our students and educators, first responders, and for Pleasant Hill, we're praying for Edwin Beeson in recovery, T.H. Williams, Ruth Scott, the family of Ruth Scott. Uh, we're praying for Philip Davis. We're praying for Phyllis Owens, Evelyn Allman, Reverend Pete Gable, and Geraldine Hicks. We're adding to our prayer list this week, Julie Stickler, Let's remember Julie as um, she continues to go to the doctors. For those homebound or nursing homes, Ruth Adams and Harold and Ada Ray. Uh, we have a, another request to add, and that is uh, for Jeff Craven, who is battling cancer, and for Charles Lindquist. Charles is a fellow pastor who had uh, a heart attack. He is at home. And he is uh, back at work already. And uh, he did have some stents put in. And we're thankful for the Lord's healing for our brother Charles. We're also praying for our military. We're praying for our country right now. Uh, a lot of things going on. And we lift them up to the Lord. Let's pray. So let's join together as we pray. Father God, we thank you for all your kindness to us. We ask. Lord, that you would hear and answer our prayer today. You've heard all of these names and all the many needs, and you hear the report of joy as well from our hearts, thanking you for answers to prayer in the past and for what you will do in the future. 
Father, as we worship you here, now, in this moment, and this time, we offer up our confidence in who you are and what you have done. And we give our thanks and we give our praise and we give our offering of love to you this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would now watch over us as we continue to delve into your word and we see what James has to say about being a teleos, a mature Christian. These things we pray in the name of the Father. Amen. Our message today comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. And we're in part three of the Telios series. Telios is a Greek word which means mature, functional, somebody who has grown up in Christ. And the message today is about money. And so I've called it dollar sense. James chapter 1, beginning of verse 9. Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises, grass withers, the little flower droops and falls, and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Our contemporary society is characterized by an awful reality that there is a growing economic gap. The rich are getting much richer and the poor are getting much poorer. The so-called middle class is disappearing altogether. But for the Christian, there is an even more disturbing phenomenon coming along. It's the mentality that jumping the gap from poor to prosperity ought to be done no matter what the cost is. At any cost, get your share. Well, the Bible never condemns wealth or being prosperous, but it does condemn the heart that's preoccupied with wealth. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money. Now, it sounds like greed, doesn't it? That's exactly what it is. Some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. This verse has Paul warning believers that the love of money has the power to take away your true faith in Jesus if you let it. And that is a sorrowful end to faith. In the fifth chapter of the book of James, the apostle refers to rich men. And what he's identifying are those whose hearts stop and start with the rise of the stock market. Those among us who are preoccupied with wealth. That's another euphemism for greedy. Incidentally, you can fall into that category. It doesn't make a difference what the size of your portfolio or the balance of your checkbook may be. James warns the self-serving rich, and he warns the envious poor and everyone in between that we can all have dollar signs blinding our Christian walk. We need to see clearly what materialism or greed brings. And we're going to look at the results of materialism or greed in the life of a believer. Are you ready? There are three moving parts to this this morning. Result number one of materialism is the crash that comes from depending on things or money or power or whatever it is to make your life meaningful. Materialism is the desire to possess, whether it's material things like a new house or a car or this or that, or position or power, or recognition. It's the desire to gain no matter what you must do in order to accomplish your goals. However else you care to characterize greed, that's exactly what it is. James compares the prosperity of things, of having things, to the lifespan of wildflowers. They come up fast, they're beautiful, they're nice to look at, but their life is very, very short. And then they're forgotten. We used to have a dachshund, a hot dog dog, if you will. Her name was Jerry, but the family named, nicknamed her Piranha for a very good reason. One day when our daughter Carrie was very, very young, Piranha lived up to her name. Uh, Carrie left her sandwich within dachshund range and the thief made off with it. The crash 
for that greedy little dog came when Jerry discovered it was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now listen, emphasis on the word peanut butter there because that's the way it is in Brownworth home. We love peanut butter. The dog tried for 20 minutes to get her mouth unstuck. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can go for the brass ring, as they say. You can reach for your piece of the treasure, but you can be certain that whatever you grab for will stick to you. God has told us in many ways that meaning in life will be found in fellowship, in relationship with him and with other people, not in things. When things or power or experiences become your focus, you lose meaning. It is a crash. There's a second crash, which is the result of materialism or greed in a believer's life. And that's that a crash will come from realizing that things have replaced relationships in your life. This is related to depending on things to make life meaningful, getting stuff at any cost, even using people to get things. James says that will eat you from within. When you see your life as meaningful because you have things and you're willing to get them at the expense or the cost of your relationships. In the fifth chapter of James, we read it this way, verses one through six, I'm reading from the message New Testament, which is the gospel in street language. A final word to you arrogant rich, take some lessons in lament. You will need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you piled up is judgment. All the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You have looted the earth and lived it up but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you've done is condemn and murder perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. The concept of people defrauding each other is not a new thing. Jesus once told about a guy who owed a ton of money to a man, and he went to the man and he said, I can't repay it, not in a million years, and the man forgave the debt, forgave him entirely. The guy was stunned, but he went out and he looked for the guy that owed him just a little bit of money. And he was in the process of choking it out of him when the other guy who forgave him all that fortune that he owed came, found out about it. And the end of that guy was much worse than his beginning, much worse than it was before. When riches replace our respect for people relationships, there is a crash on the horizon. Relationships crash in the wake of greed. There's little doubt that focusing on materialism or greed takes your focus off God. You can't love God and money, scripture says. And for that which he has created you, how do we combat this? How do we, how do, we do something about it? How do we guard against becoming a materialist, a person who gives in to the love of money? How can we accomplish destroying greed in our souls? How can we battle the temptation of materialism? I'd like us to take a lesson from the principles of aerodynamics, how a plane steers through the winds above. There are two wings on a plane, we know, that are horizontal wings, but there's a vertical wing also, and it's at the back of the plane. That one that sticks straight up and down is called a stabilizer, and it keeps the aircraft going in the direction that the pilot wants to steer. Without a stabilizer, a plane might get off the ground, it might be able to fly, but it will go wherever the wind pushes it because it has no ability to steer. That stabilizer helps it cut through the wind and helps the pilot steer the plane. Well, the Apostle James gives us some principles for God's people that act as spiritual stabilizers against the winds of economic tides. These stabilizers help us navigate false materialism, the winds of greed, if you will. And there are three of them that I want to share with you. The first of these is that in order to have stability financially, 
in our lives, it's not necessary to earn more money. It's necessary to remember God's prior claim in our life. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns it all. Now, it's true that God has given us this entire world to enjoy and have a wonderful life. We just need to view that in the proper context. He's the owner. We are caretakers. We are stewards. And when you consider even your own life, remember who owns that. God is in charge. He has prior claim on everything you can see and everything you can't see. He has it all. A second spiritual stabilizer is reviewing our lifestyle. We need to take a look at our lifestyle, what we do um, with what God has blessed us with. Paul taught the early church about coming to worship with wrong motives or unconfessed sin. What did he tell them to do? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, he told them, let everyone examine themselves, examine their lives, examine their motives, examine, examine their attitude. This is good advice for a believer. I had a friend who told me many years ago that he could be, he could find out if somebody was truly living the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ in five minutes. He said, give me five minutes with a guy's checkbook and I'll tell you if that's a disciple of Jesus. We should review every line in the checkbook. How did I get what I have, what I got? How do, am I using what I have? What's my attitude towards things? Things. If you're going to combat materialism in your life, you have to understand your own motives and the way that you see material things. That's because materialism begins in the heart. That's where the issues of life start. It's what we think about things that constructs who we are in the everyday of life. The devil is a master at manipulating even the smartest or most disciplined person who refuses to honestly examine his life and confess his sin of materialism or greed. And you got to confess that quickly. You've got to make a decision quickly about whether or not things are more important than God and people. Uh, over in Africa, there was a group of natives uh, who found a very clever way to catch monkeys alive. Uh, they would find a hollow log and they would uh, bore a hole in the thing. And uh, the hole was just big enough for a monkey's hand to fit through it. Now, I, I made this hole big enough for my hand, but this is for the, for the principle. What they would do is they would take something that was very desirable for a monkey and uh, put it into the hole in the log. And once it was in there, uh, as a monkey came by, and monkeys have very good sense of smell, and so they knew something good was in there, and they'd reach their hand in there. You know, kind of scrunch their little paw down there and reach around and find out what it was that was so good. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. And then they would try to pull it out, and that's when the trap would spring. You see, what happens is when your hand grabs onto something, it's much bigger than when you scrunched it up to get it in the hole. I can take my hand in and out very easily if I scrunch it together. But once you wrap your hand around something, you cannot hold it and get your hand out again. And that's the whole purpose of the trap. The monkey it refused to let go, which is what stupid monkeys would do, and it's what stupid people would do, the monkey would be trapped and he'd have no way of getting away and his life would belong to somebody else. For a Christian, answering this kind of a question is to ask a similar question. How do I feel about tithing my income? Many people object to tithing by pointing out how much they need to live on. It's funny, isn't it? How people who claim to be Christians trust God with their eternity can't seem to muster enough faith to trust God to take care of the power bill next month. We need to remember who's in charge. We need to remember that material things are not the most important thing in our life. We also then need to recommit to God's ways. Jim Elliott was a missionary who went to minister to the Alka Indians, and he was brutally martyred by the very people to whom he went to share the good news. This is a half century ago. His famous statement 
was taken from his diary and it goes like this. A man is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He was talking about God's love. He was talking about salvation. Jim Elliot was committed to Christ no matter what the cost. That's what put materialism out of business. Recommit to God's way, whatever the material, the emotional, or physical, or the worldly cost might be, recommit to God's ways. And so we end here where we begin. James says in verse 9 of our text, chapter 1, verse 9, that the humble ought to rejoice. Rejoice in your high position in Christ. Being poor or rich by the world's standards is just measuring by the wrong bank account. A good name, it says in Proverbs 22, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So the reality check for the Christian includes remembering God's prior claim on everything. He's the owner. Reviewing how I think about and use material things and recommitting to God's way. Living God's way is all about plugging into the joy of Jesus' life. John 15, 11, he told his disciples, these things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray together. Father, help us to enter the life of Jesus Christ. We pray to be transformed from what we think is riches into the image of he who defines the richness of eternal life. Your beloved son, firstborn, lived a life of joy because his heart and his hands were always open. His heart was willing to forgive us and his hands open to be nailed to a tree for us. Teach us to live that way is our prayer. For the glory and honor and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to exalt and magnify the majesty of the Father. Amen. Well, that's our worship for today. And as we come to the close of this series in James, we invite you to come back again next week. Don't forget our Ash Wednesday service coming up on the 17th, uh, go get some palms or something to burn to make some ashes, a little bit of uh, uh, olive oil, a dash of vegetable oil, whatever it takes. Be ready. Wednesday, the video should be up uh, Wednesday morning, so any time during the day on Wednesday. God bless you is our prayer. You're welcome at Mount Zion in Bennett or Pleasant Hill in uh, Seagrove. You're welcome to give us a call, send us an email, let us know uh, what your needs are, what your prayer requests are. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus' name. Amen.